All right, our recording is in progress. And I just want to uh, uh, say something to our recording crowd. Welcome, welcome them. Uh, we are in session three for our recording uh, crowd. Uh, the epistles, learning to think contextually. And we're still in our series, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. I'm Paul McLeod, the Minister of Education here at Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. Thank you all for joining us and watching this recording. Let me make this quick announcement uh, before we jump into our main part of the Bible study. I'm not sure if many of you all heard, but uh, Joyce Howard, uh, the wife of, um, of Willie uh, Howard Jr., uh, and the sister of Karen Thompson, their, their uh, mother passed away, uh, Cecil Gill, and her funeral is going to be this Friday at Tabernacle Baptist Church. Visitation will start at 11 a.m. The funeral will start at 11.30. So visitation, it, it is a short visitation from 11 to 11.30, and then the funeral uh, will start at 11.30. Again, that's Cecil Gill, the mother of Joyce Howard and Karen Thompson will be this Friday. Tabernacle Church visitation at 11, funeral at 1130. Uh, so be in prayer for uh, Joyce and for Karen and their family in the passing of their of their mother. So please keep that in. Please keep that in mind. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I have uh, a few slides for you, and we'll go ahead and take a look at that. There we go. Get some things out of the way. And I'll put it in slide mode. And switch the screens. There we go. Now on your screen, you should see, you should see the... Um, Yep, there we go. You should see the slide, how to read the Bible, for all its worth. Uh, today, we're going to take a look at the epistles, learning to think contextually. Now, before we do that, I want to do a, a quick review uh, of our discussion and some things that should have come out in your, in your reading. Last week, and your reading this week, was about the basic tool, a good translation. The central idea around your reading and the discussion from last week is that the best English Bible translation is faithful to the meaning of the best original language man manuscripts and is communicated in normal English. Uh, let me break that down just, uh, uh, just a second. It's kind of a long sentence. The best English Bible translation and realize that the Bible was uh, written originally in Hebrew and Aramaic in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament. And so what we're reading are English Bible translations. And those translations can be the King James Version, New King James, NIV, NLT, uh, Good News Bible, uh, and those are English Bible translations. Now, the best translations, they are faithful to the meaning we want to make sure that we get accurate meaning of the best original language manuscripts. Now, I'm not sure if I really pointed this out very well last week, uh, but I think it was mentioned in the video that we do not have the original uh, copies or the original manuscripts called autographs of any of the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament. However, through uh, a lot of study, uh, a lot of um, a lot of scholars doing textual criticism and the number of manuscripts, you put all that together, we are, are really confident that our translations, our English Bible translations are faithful to the original manuscripts or the autographs. And so we want to use the best original manuscripts and communicate it in normal English so that we can get the meaning of it. So that was our central idea for this past week. We also learned that the English Bible translations differ because translators must make choices about two areas, the text and the theory of translation. If you remember in our discussion, I mentioned, and, and in your reading, I think did a good job of pointing out that we do have differences 
in our English Bible translation. If you were to put two or three translations side by side, you would notice some differences. Well, the good news is that these differences, for the most part, do not affect any of our doctrine. Uh, even if we see um, uh, differences between, for example, maybe the King James Version and NIV, and you compared all of those changes, or I'm sorry, all of those differences, uh, they do not add up to any doctrinal uh, criticism or any doctrinal uh, major differences. And so that's the good thing about it. But we need to understand that translators, when they go from the original languages to English, they have some choices to make in the text, which manuscripts to use, how do you read certain documents, and in their theory of translation. Do they want to be super literal and have the form of the original language? Or do they want to lean towards um, uh, the meaning and, and translating the meaning and making sure that gets uh, accurately portrayed? So that's why there are differences in our English translations. You'll remember also, and you can, and when I changed the view, you can see it in the background. I recommended Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary came out back in 2014. For those of you who um, used the Baker Illustrated Bible Dictionary, the one that I uh, recommended probably six, almost seven years ago, that's still a good dictionary. You don't have to toss that out the window or anything. But uh, after looking at several Illustrated Bible Dictionaries, I'm going with Nelson's. And last week, I, I told you my criteria and kind of went through my thought process. So that is a review of what we talked about last week. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask, and you can go ahead and take yourself off of mute if you would like, but uh, are there any questions or comments um, that you would like to make about the reading or our discussion from last week? Any, anything at all? This is a good, uh, a good chance to talk about uh, any questions you have or any comments that you have. Paul, I, I hadn't picked up my book because I've been out of town and then when I got back, I was sick. So I'm just sitting in. I'm kind of in the dark right now. Okay. All right, Carrie. <laughs> well, come by at your convenience. I tell you what, contact me before you come over. I've taken the books off of the resource table mm -hmm. up front. Mm -hmm. I have very few books um, uh, remaining. So make sure to get a hold of me and uh, I'll, I'll get you a book. Okay. Thank you. All right. And of course, the recordings are available. And I was mentioning to some, uh, some people who had joined the Bible study early that the book is actually optional. Uh, I strongly recommend that you go ahead and pick up the book and read along. Uh, the video, I think, does a good job of hitting the highlights. However, more detailed information is in the book. And so that's why I strongly recommend that you go ahead and read the book. And by the way, I, I did mention to some people that I'll, I'll mention it right now that the book is dense. The book is a lot different than the story. <laughs> there's, no, there's no comparison. It's a little more technical. It's a little more dense. Mm -hmm. However, I'm strongly recommending that you go ahead and pick up the book and read it, even if you think that you're not understanding a lot of the words or some of the concepts uh, may be escaping you, you'll be surprised how much you pick up just from the exposure to some of these conversations, some of these concepts, for example, textual criticism. And don't get frustrated uh, if, if you're not picking up everything. I think I used the phrase earlier, uh, you know, eat it all and then spit mm -hmm. out the bones. <laughs> the parts that you don't quite understand, just keep it moving and you'll pick up uh, some more as you as you go. So if it, maybe you're a little frustrated um, or you're just not getting it or maybe a little overwhelmed at this point, I encourage you to keep going and go ahead and read, pick up as much as you can. Uh, for some of you, uh, this is a stretch and this is a good opportunity to stretch you. And, learn more. 
um, and but it'll take some effort. And then for some of you, this this type of book, this type of material is no sweat at all, and you can and you can just breeze through it. So we're all at different places, but I do want to encourage you to go ahead and try, and you'll be surprised how much you how much you learn. So thank you for the uh, comment, Carrie, for letting me know. Any other questions or comments? Anything at all? I have a I have a question. Certainly. You were saying that the English translation is the best translation, or I won't say best, better, as opposed to what other translations? What I was talking about was the difference between the English translations. Uh, for example, the King James versus the NLT. Oh, okay. Right. Some tr English translations um, are very, very literal. And the translators have tried to replicate the form of the original language. And you'll notice that maybe word order is, is kind of funny. Um, and choice of words is kind of funny. And they're trying to just be super literal to the original language. Uh, for example, uh, the King James Version and the New King James Version and the ESV are three off the top of my head that are, are very literal. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you do have some that aren't so picky as far as the form. They just want to make sure you get the meaning in everyday English language. For example, the NLT it is like that. And then there are some in the middle, uh, what I call mediating translations, that, that try to be um, uh, literal to the form and literal to the or accurate to the meaning and they're kind of in the middle and i would classify the new international version as one of those mediating or in the middle type of translations so that's what that's what i mean by it, it's a difference between english translations oh okay does that kind of make guess, sense yeah i guess the part i struggle with is how do you determine what you're saying see i'm still struggling how do you determine which one is best and I mean, I, I'm still struggling with who determined that, but you're saying it's based on the, the literal meaning of the, of the scripture. Yeah, on, you know, on the one hand, I wouldn't say that there are any bad translations. We okay. are very blessed to have English translations that for the most part convey the meaning of the original manuscripts. So even, even the King James, uh, there are some words in the King James that I don't know what they mean. Uh, you know, I have to stop and get the Oxford uh, Bible dic or Oxford Dictionary out, uh, the, the 17th uh, uh, century edition, to know what they mean. And, and, and so it's maybe a little harder to read. Uh, oh, okay. On the other hand, um, if, if you do struggle with some of the word choices and some of the it's beautiful language, of the King James Version, it's okay to, to go with an NIV or an NLT or, or something like that. Um, so I, I use the word best um, kind of lightly uh, because oh, it okay. on where you are as far as reading and what you're mm -hmm. trying to do also. And I try to emphasize also that if you're studying, oh, well, have one primary version that you bring to church, that you do uh, large chunks of reading in and have your primary um, have your primary translation. And just personally, I recommend having a mediating translation that's kind of in the middle, maybe like an NIV or something like that for everyday use. However, if you study, you want to use more than one translation. Okay. You want to you want to get something on the end of being really literal, like the King James Version or the ESV. And also on the other end, as being uh, not as formal like the uh, NLT. So when I study, my everyday Bible is the NIV. But when I study, I sit down and I have side by side, I have the NIV, I have the ESV, and I have the NLT. So as I'm reading along, if there's something very different, if they're all, if they're, I notice something very different, uh, there's a big difference, then that keys me. That's a red flag that, hey, something's going on here. And that helps me to kind of go down the rabbit trail of, of getting into the Bible dictionary or a commentary and, and understanding why that difference is. 
Okay. I'm, that's better. I'm better understanding that now. Okay. Because at first I was thinking that one was better, that you were saying one was better than the other. It's just one that's more understandable than the other. Yeah. yeah. More, that makes sense. Yeah. More understandable and understanding right. uh, how you're using it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Good okay. question. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. hey, hello. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. What's your take on that? Yes, I, it's been a while since I have looked at the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. It, it's been uh, years and years since I've, I've looked at it. I, I think it's great. In, in terms of, of some of the cross references are classic, I, I would call classic as far as you look at a scripture and it points you to another scripture that um, I don't want to say is linked to it, but re, it, but they're closely associated or, or you know how scripture explains scripture. Uh, and so it does a good job of, of that. Um, however, it is a little dated. Uh, it's a, it's an older reference, and um, it doesn't take into account some of the um, newer findings, uh, uh, some of the uh, manuscript uh, up to date manuscript findings, um, the uh, and some of the archaeological findings that help us to do some of the cross references. Um, so I, I think it's a I think it's an okay reference. Um, it, a, a better reference might be one of the modern translations that do have cross references. Uh, for example, I think the ESV and the NIV have a cross reference sex, uh, uh, cross reference system also uh, that is pretty good. I found it to be uh, I found it to be pretty good. So overall, I, I think the Thompson cross reference Bible is is okay if you're using using that. Uh, but there might be a, a reference or two that's a little better than that. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Paul, I have in my notes, Holman, under the Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, what was your reference about Holman's? Was that an option for the dictionary? Yes, yes. Um, over the last few years, I've, I've been on and off looking at a whole bunch of dictionaries and uh, over the last couple of months, I had it narrowed down to four uh, dictionaries. Uh, there was the Nelson, which I ended up- uh, You're going downstairs. That's the winner. Uh, there was also the Holman. If you're not gonna eat your food, put it in there. Oh, uh, there was also the Holman, which was a semi, what I call a finalist. <laughs> uh, there was also the Zonervan, that was a, a finalist. Uh, and what was the fourth one? Uh, I know it was. Nelson, there was Holman, there was Zonervan. It might have been Ungers. I can't remember which one it was. Somebody's somebody's got all four of their notes, I know. But uh, yes, Holman was one of the was one of the finalists. And uh, oh, just a, a comment as far as Holman is concerned. I don't have my notes here with me, but. Um, I think Holman came in as a close second. Yes, if I remember right, came in as a close second. Uh, what tipped the scales for me was in the Nelson, they have a lot of great front material, what I call front material. Uh, they have a, a, a lot of charts and some summary information uh, about the Bible uh, overall that the Holman didn't have. Uh, Holman and Nelson had similar maps. I, I like the, the Nelson, the Holman maps maybe just a little better. Uh, so if you choose the Holman or the Nelson, I think it's good either way. I just lean towards the, the Nelson overall. Was that, uh, did that answer your question? I think that was uh, Margaret. Yes, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions, comments? Well, Paul, I got this one from you uh, when we had our first, uh, the story, and it's called the Baker Illustrated Bible Dictionary. Right. Is that a good one? 
Yes, yes. You don't throw that out the window. That's still a good one. Okay. It, didn't, it didn't make my finalist list uh, yeah. only because recently, since about 2013, they've come up, uh, some of the publishers have come out with um, um, some dictionaries that I think were better are better than the Baker Illustrated mm -hmm. Bible Dictionary. However, it still is a good it still is a good um, uh, Bible dictionary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. don't, don't throw it away. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Any other any other questions? Oh. All right. Well, let me get back on the screen here. I'll uh, go ahead and mute all and sh I'm going to share my screen for uh, just another minute and then we'll get into our our video. Uh, yes, yes, this, let's do our media poll. That's that was my that was my uh, prompt for the media poll. I'll pull up our polls. One more poll before we go to the to the video. I was very I'm very uh, curious and you'll see on your screen just a short question. What Bible media do you prefer? What Bible media do you prefer? Do you prefer paper? Do you prefer digital? Or do you prefer both? And there's a single, single answer. Paper, digital, or both? Since we've been talking about the Bible, I wanted to see what kind of, kind of group we have here. Give you a minute. All right, we're doing we're doing pretty uh, doing pretty well. Let's see what our figures look like. Thirty three out of thirty four, ninety seven percent. Wonderful. Thank you. And you can see the results on the screen. Ah, interesting. This, this turned out a little uh, different than I thought it would. Paper, uh, almost tied with both. And digital, <coughs> excuse me, digital only is one person. So we have most people using both, a close second, Paper only. I should have. I put it. Should have put paper only or digital only. But hopefully you caught the the meaning of that. Uh, and then and then a lot of people use both. A, a couple of people have asked me uh, what what I like to use. I used to be paper only uh, up until about maybe ten years ago. I used to just be paper only, and it was almost like a religion for me. Oh, this digital stuff, you know, is is of the devil and. <laughs> not, not. I wasn't that bad, but I thought I was a paper only person, only because I like books so much. As I started getting into the digital, I, I especially when I was in school, I understood the value of digital because uh, I'm usually reading two or three books at a time. And when I was in school, I, I was reading uh, four or five books at a time, and lugging around those books and doing the research was really cumbersome. Uh, using paper only, uh, references in Bible. And so I started using more and more digital and I could just copy and paste. It was great for my papers. All I, I, I just carried around my tablet and I could read three or four books at a time. Everything was on my tablet. And so I started swinging to digital and almost went to digital only. However, over the last couple of years, I swung back and I'm, and I'm probably dead in the middle right now. I use both paper and digital. The reason I, I started swinging back to paper is that I noticed, and, and I'd actually read studies about this and I guess personally verified it uh, myself, is that when I handle paper and I have a book in my hands, for example, you know, our book here, and I'm going through the book and I'm underlining and I'm making notes, I, I learn better. And, and I retain the information better uh, because that's how I learn. I'm, I'm visual and I'm also what they call kinetic. 
Um, I, I, I like to use my hands and have some motion while I'm reading a book because I ask the book questions. I actually do I ask the book questions. I get the answers. I underline, I mark up, I, I dog ear, all that kind of stuff. And all that process helps me to learn the material a lot better. When I read it on a tablet or on the computer, I have less interaction. And so I don't pick up on the material as well uh, as I do in, in paper. So that's just my, you know, that, that's just me personally. Everybody learns maybe a little differently. And I think uh, I think a, a, a good balance is, is probably where, where to go. There's some people who still say paper only and um, and will we'll, uh, go to the grave with paper only. There's some people who are digital only, especially some of the younger people. And they're like, ooh, paper, you, ooh, I don't wanna touch paper. I actually had a young person uh, say that. Uh, ooh, I don't touch any paper. Oh, I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> I thought that was quite funny. So any, uh, any comments about that as far as your, uh, as your media is concerned? Paul, I agree with you 100% because that's what I do. Um, I, I have on the line and when I get ready to come back for reference or to look over something, I can find it better because I have to reread it because I, it's either highlighted or underlined. I can get to things quicker. Okay. Digital, digital I get to look at other places that I don't have. But even if you save it, it's just like you materials out there, but it takes too long to find what I need. Right. So I'm with you on the on that part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Uh one aspect also I just wanted to bring out is when I especially when I was in school, um, I probably have uh, uh, three three thousand books uh digitally um in a large library. If I had that many books, there's no way I could even find what I needed. Digitally, I can find what I'll need by searching or filtering or whatever I need. So just the amount of books that I have, a lot of my work is digital. However, if I'm going through a Bible study, uh, like what we're going through, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have both. I have a digital copy of our book and I have the physical copy and, um, but I like interacting with the paper when I'm when I'm learning something like a whole book. So any other any other questions or comments about Bible media? OK, let me pose one question to you before we go to our uh, video and I'll share my screen. There we go. And you can see it on your screen. Here's the big question for today. And, and it really helps shape our, our central idea is that how do we determine the original intended meaning of scripture in an epistle? And an epistle is just a fancy word for a letter uh, like Paul's epistles. So how do we determine our, our whole goal here is to read the Bible, to understand it, and then apply it to our lives. But, but the first part of it is that we have to first understand the original intended meaning of the scripture. And today we're looking at just epistles. That's what we're, that's what we're looking at. And so uh, that's our question for today. I'm gonna go ahead and share our, our video and You'll have to make sure to turn up or down your device, depending on how it's going to come out to you. But here we go with our video for session number number three. We start our study of the various genres of the Bible with the epistles. 
An epistle is just a formal or literary term for a letter. There are two good reasons for starting with the epistles, one positive and one negative. Positively, most people are very familiar with the epistles. These letters are perhaps the most well-known, widely taught and studied portions of the Bible. We often turn to them first when we're looking for application to our lives. Since these letters were written to churches and to individuals within the church, and since we today are the church, it's easy to apply their commands and principles directly to our own situation. When I read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I see direct application to myself and to my church. I don't need to think about culture or a gap of time and space between us and the original readers. Yet there's a flip side to this familiarity that should raise a caution. Since the epistles are so familiar, we can easily be deceived into thinking that they're always speaking directly to us. We can forget that they are occasional documents written to particular churches in a particular time, in a particular place. Their commands and exhortations may or may not apply directly to us. We can forget, in short, that we are reading someone else's mail from 2,000 years ago. Let me illustrate this. I don't think anyone would object if I said, Paul tells us that we should glorify God in all that we do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. But what if I said, Paul tells us we should pick up his cloak that he left in Troas and bring it to him in Rome, 2 Timothy 4, 13. We would laugh and say that command was given to Timothy in the first century, not to us. But the command to glorify God in all that we do was also given to the church at Corinth in the first century, not given to us. How do we know it applies to us any more than Paul's command to Timothy to bring his cloak to Rome? Similarly, I could say that in 1 Peter 2.11, Peter tells us to avoid sexual immorality. But what if I said, Peter tells us to greet one another with a kiss, 1 Peter 5.14. Why do we obey one command but treat the other as optional? Similarly, many take it very seriously when Paul tells wives to submit to their husbands in Ephesians 5.22. This they assume is a universal command for all time. But Paul also tells women to cover their heads in worship, 1 Corinthians 11.5. Is this also a universal command for the church of all time? Or is it related to the first century cultural context? How do we make decisions on these kinds of issues? You see, because most of what the epistles say is easy to apply today, we can easily miss that these letters are in fact occasional documents written to a specific audience in a specific place and time. Not everything they say is necessarily meant to be a command for us or for the church of all time. Discerning what is a universal mandate and what is not can be a challenging task. For this reason, we'll deal with the epistles in two sessions. This first will cover the exegesis of the epistles, understanding their meaning in its original context. The second session will deal with the hermeneutics of the epistles, what we need to know to contextualize them for today. So let's talk first of all about the nature of the epistles. Reading through the letters, we see that they are not all the same. Some are written to individuals, others to churches. Some are quite short, others are very long, in fact, much longer than most letters that have been discovered from the ancient world. Many years ago, a scholar named Adolf Deisman compared the New Testament epistles to the papyri. The papyri were ancient documents discovered mostly in Egypt. They're written on papyrus, a paper-like material made from a reed-like plant grown in marshy areas. Manufactured especially in Egypt, papyrus was the most common writing material of the ancient Mediterranean world. These papyri were everyday documents discovered in the garbage heaps of Egypt. From his analysis of the New Testament epistles and other ancient writings, Deisman made a distinction between what he called true letters and what he called epistles. True letters were non-literary, meaning they were private correspondence intended specifically for the person or persons to whom they were addressed, not for the general public. 
Epistles, on the other hand, were formatted like letters, but were artistic literary documents intended for the general public and for posterity. They were like an essay or a letter to the editor in a newspaper, meant to be read by everybody. Deisman concluded that all of the letters of Paul, as well as 2nd and 3rd John, those little letters, were real letters. The rest of the letters in the New Testament he called epistles. This distinction between letters and epistles can be helpful, although a strict distinction is really oversimplification. The literary form of the New Testament letters is more complicated than that. First, all of the New Testament epistles are really true letters. By this we mean they were written to a particular time and place, to a particular audience. None were written strictly as literature for the general public. Yet all of them are also artistic and literary to a greater or lesser degree. Consider, for example, the letter to the Romans. Paul's greatest work, his magnum opus, we might say. Romans is a very fine literary work with a well-crafted argument from beginning to end. It's much like an essay. It's much longer also than most first century letters. Yet it's also very much a letter. It begins like a letter, identifying the author and the recipients. It concludes with a series of greetings to individuals. It's written to a very specific audience, a group of house churches in Rome. It's also written under very specific circumstances and intended to address a specific situation. Paul wrote the letter from the city of Corinth on his third missionary journey. He was planning a missionary outreach into Spain and he writes the Roman church to enlist their support for his outreach into Spain. The letter to the Hebrews is another case in point. On the surface, it looks much more like an epistle than a letter. It's missing a number of key characteristics of letters. The author is not named at the beginning, as was common in first century letters, nor are the recipients specifically addressed. We don't know for sure who the letter was written to, though there were hints about the circumstances, their circumstances throughout Hebrews. The epistle, in fact, begins very much like an essay, or as many have suggested, like a sermon. It begins like this. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. That doesn't sound very much like a letter. There's no dear friends. Yet as we read the letter, we learn that the author is addressing a very specific group of people about a very specific topic. He speaks of their past circumstances. He speaks of their persecution and the suffering they've experienced. He encourages them to persevere and stay faithful. He addresses personal concerns, telling them that Timothy may come to see them shortly and that the author himself plans to come. The letter ends with a benediction and with greetings for the leaders of the congregation and for the congregation in general. This is clearly a letter with an author, recipients, and a specific occasion. Yet it's also a well-crafted essay or sermon. The author himself calls it a word of exhortation. Chapter 13, verse 22. The diversity of the New Testament letters is also evident in their structure. Ancient letters tended to follow a very defined structure with six parts. These parts included, first of all, the name of the author. Secondly, the name of the recipients. Third, there'd be a greeting to the person, to the recipient, to the person being addressed. Fourth, there'd sometimes be a prayer wish or a thanksgiving for that person. Fifth would be the body of the letter, whatever the author was speaking about. And then finally, there'd be greetings and a farewell. The most variable of these is number four, the prayer wish or the thanksgiving. Some letters have these kinds of thanksgivings. Um, some of them don't. Apart from this, however, most letters follow this basic structure, and most New Testament letters do as well. Some, however, don't. As just mentioned, Hebrews begins like an essay with no identification of the author or the recipients. Similarly, the letter of 1 John does not begin in a typical manner. There's no identification of the author or the recipients. Instead, the letter begins like this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. 
1 John 1. This is a summary of the coming of Jesus and those who witnessed it. It reads much more like an essay or a theological treatise than a letter. Yet as we read further in 1 John, we recognize the author is addressing a specific audience. He clearly knows them well and addresses them as his spiritual children. They are a specific, they are a specific group of believers who are struggling with confidence in their faith because of certain circumstances. Some false teachers have arisen in the church. These false teachers were once part of the congregation, but they've now deserted and are spreading lies and seeking to sow doubts in the members of the congregation that remain. John rejects these false teachers and goes so far as to refer to them as antichrists since they deny the truth about Jesus. They deny the truth about his death on the cross as payment for our sins. John writes to refute the false teachers and to encourage and provide assurance for the believers. These examples from Romans, Hebrews, and 1 John confirm for us something important about all the epistles. Whether they follow a formal format, like a letter or not, all of them are occasional documents. This means that they're written for a specific occasion, in a specific time and place, to a specific audience, to address specific concerns. This occasional nature of the epistles also teaches us something else about their nature and theology. All of their theology is what we could call task theology. By this we mean it is theological truth brought to bear on specific tasks or concerns within the church. No New Testament writer sat down to write a book on systematic theology or on Christian ethics. Instead, they introduce theological truth in response to specific issues and concerns in the church. That's what we mean by task theology. Let me just illustrate this. Philippians chapter 2 is the greatest passage in the New Testament concerning what we call the incarnation, that God became a human being in the person of Jesus the Messiah. In an amazingly powerful passage, Paul describes how Jesus, who was in the form of God, equal to the Father and fully divine, how he left his position of glory to become a human being, taking upon himself the form of a lowly servant. And as a servant, he submitted himself to death, the worst and most humiliating death imaginable, crucifixion. Yet because of his obedience, God raised him from the dead and exalted him to a position of authority, over all things. Because of this exaltation, everyone in the universe will one day bow down and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is an amazing statement of theology in Philippians 2, the greatest statement of the incarnation ever written. But do you know why Paul mentioned it here? The church in Philippi was struggling with this unity. And Paul knows the only way to create unity is to encourage humility, looking out for the needs of others first. So he points to the ultimate example of humility, which was the incarnation of the Son of God. If Jesus, who was God himself, was willing to empty himself and become a lowly human being, and if he was willing to sacrifice himself for the sins of the world, shouldn't we be willing to humble ourselves to restore unity to the church? So this great statement about the incarnation is in fact task theology. The task or challenge is the problem of disunity and lack of humility. Paul brings this theological truth of the incarnation to address this specific concern in the church. The epistles are full of theology, great theology, but it's all task theology. In our first session, we talked about two kinds of context, historical context and literary context. Let's discuss each of these with reference to the epistles. First, the historical context. As you recall, the historical context refers to the entire life setting of the document. For the epistles, this includes things like the author, the recipients, the occasion that prompted the letter's writing. What were the recipients going through? Why did the author feel the need to sit down and write these things? All of these things relate to the historical context. Sometimes the historical context of an epistle is very clear and specific. Sometimes it's much more general. Let me illustrate this with a few of the, the New Testament letters. 
Consider 1 Thessalonians, for example. By reading the letter itself and comparing the account of the establishment of the church in Acts 17, we can piece together the circumstances that led to the writing of the letter. Paul visited the city of Thessalonica, which is in Macedonia, northern Greece, on his second missionary journey. He established the church there, but then persecution broke out and he was forced to leave. He went on to Berea and then to Athens and finally to Corinth. Yet all the while, he was very concerned about this young church. He was concerned because they were suffering persecution. He kept trying to return, but each time he was thwarted. Finally, from Athens, he sent Timothy, his assistant, to check on the church. Timothy went up there to Thessalonica and found the church to be thriving, to be doing great despite the persecution. He reported this to Paul, who sat down to write a letter of encouragement to the church for their perseverance, because they were holding firm, no matter what the, the, the struggles they were going through. And he calls the church to even greater spiritual growth. That's the historical context of 1 Thessalonians, the setting in which it was written. In a case like this, identifying the historical context really helps us to better understand the message of the letter. Now, while 1 Thessalonians has a very specific historical context, other epistles are much more general. 1 Peter, for example, was written to a widely dispersed audience throughout the, the large area of five Roman provinces in what is modern Turkey. The letter is very general one. It doesn't deal with specific issues or individuals in the churches. Instead, it focuses especially on the theme of Christian suffering and persecution, something these many churches had in common. It also focuses on the believer's identity in Christ. Again, a very general theme that fits all of these churches in these five Roman provinces. The letter of James is somewhat similar to 1 Peter. It appears to be written to Jewish Christians scattered throughout the Roman Empire. It contains mostly general and proverbial teaching. Nevertheless, we can still call these letters occasional documents since they are written by specific individuals at a specific point in time to address specific concerns within the, the larger first century church. So how do we determine the historical context of an epistle? Well, the best way is to read the letter again and again, looking at its key themes. In some cases, you can compare the letter with accounts about the church in the book of Acts, as in 1 Thessalonians. It's always a good idea then to check your conclusions against secondary sources, such as a Bible dictionary, a commentary, a Bible handbook, or a study Bible. This will confirm what you've discovered by reading the text itself. If we wish to interpret an epistle well, we have to understand not only its historical context, but also its literary context. As we said in an earlier session, the literary context of an epistle refers to the progress of the author's argument. The most important question we can ask to determine the literary context is what's the point? Why does the author say this at this point? How does it relate to what comes before and, and how does it carry forward to what follows? If what's the point is the most important question to ask, then this is best accomplished by thinking paragraphs, thinking paragraphs. A paragraph represents a natural unit of thought and most modern translations of the Bible will break each section down into paragraph divisions. While we traditionally speak of chapters and verses with reference to the Bible, we must remind ourselves that the, there, there were no chapters and verses in the original Bible. These were added much, much later as a way of finding things. And they're not necessarily the correct divisions of the book. Some Bibles make the mistake of separating each verse out as a separate paragraph. This is really not a good idea since it obscures the actual paragraphs, which represent logical units of thought. So you should use a Bible that structures the text around paragraphs rather than one that puts each verse as a separate paragraph. The best way to trace the progress of the argument or the literary context is to summarize each paragraph in a phrase or a sentence. This summary statement will help you to recognize how this paragraph relates to the one that comes before and the one that follows. Let me illustrate this with an example we've used earlier. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 is that great passage on the incarnation, when the Son of God emptied himself to become a human being. 
Just before the statement about the Incarnation, Paul has a paragraph stating the need to practice humility in order to maintain unity in the church. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 of Philippians. What follows in verse 5 is the statement, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This then introduces the statement about the incarnation as a model of humility to be followed. So whereas verses 1 to 4 could be summarized as Paul's call to unity through humility, verses 5 through 11 could be summarized as the ultimate model of humility and servanthood in the incarnation of the Son of God. By summarizing the paragraphs in this way, the logical flow of thought becomes clear. Okay, we've looked at historical context and literary context of the epistles. Finally, let's say a word about dealing with problem passages. While much of the teaching in the epistles is clear and understandable to us today, there certainly are some passages that are difficult and obscure. One of the main reasons for this, as we've said, is that these documents were not written to us. They were written 2,000 years ago in a different culture, in a different context, and in a different language. We have to do our exegesis well in order to cross the bridge back from our world into theirs. Sometimes, however, that journey can be very difficult. This is because not only are the cultures very different, but we are often hearing only one side of the conversation. In other words, we hear Paul's response, but we don't necessarily know the specific circumstances that prompted that response. It's like listening to someone talk on the telephone where you can only hear one side of the conversation. For example, in 2 Thessalonians, Paul refers to an individual he calls the man of lawlessness, who will come on the scene at some time in human history. Paul reminds the Thessalonians that he, quote, used to tell them these things, and therefore, quote, you know what is holding him, that is the man of lawlessness, back. That's 2 Thessalonians 2, 5, and 6. The problem for us is that we were not part of the earlier conversation when Paul explained these things to them. We don't know who the man of lawlessness is, nor do we know what is holding him back. The Thessalonians knew, but we do not, since we're not, we're hearing only one side of the conversation. So as we read the epistles, we'll encounter difficult and problematic passages now and then. Let me just give you a few principles to help deal with these. First of all, don't sweat the difficulties too much. The central message of the Bible remains clear, and God has given to us unambiguously what we really need to know. In general, passages that are obscure are not central to the message of the text. This includes, for example, obscure passages concerning baptism for the dead, a strange statement in 1 Corinthians 15, head coverings on women, 1 Corinthians 11, wearing short hair or long hair on men, 1 Corinthians 11 as well. These are peripheral issues that are not central to the gospel or central to the nature of our salvation. Second, we should distinguish between those things that can be known for sure and those things that are uncertain. For example, there's no doubt from what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, that some Corinthians were being baptized for the dead. It's also clear that Paul does not explicitly condemn this practice and even uses it as an argument to defend the reality of the resurrection. Beyond that, however, we have to be content with a measure of ignorance. It's very unclear what baptism for the dead actually means. One thing is clear, however, since this obscure practice is mentioned only once, only here, and without any identification or clarification, we must not make it central or a core doctrine of the faith. So don't make central what is clearly not central. A third principle, even when we cannot determine all the details, the central message of the text is usually clear. The primary point Paul is making in 1 Corinthians 15 is the reality of the bodily resurrection from the dead. This is beyond dispute no matter what the baptism for the dead means. A fourth principle, your best help for these difficult passages is using good commentaries. A good commentary is one that identifies various different possible interpretations for a particular passage and gives the best reason defense for each view. 
Finally, a fifth principle is we should be content with not knowing everything. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, on this side of eternity, we know in part. One day, however, we will fully know. We need to be content with the knowledge that God has given us. Okay, in this session, we have dealt with the exegesis of the epistles. In the next session, we'll discuss the hermeneutical questions or the contextualization of these letters. How do we apply them in our culture and our context today? There we go. All right, a lot of good information. You'll get even more information once uh, you dig into the into the book. Let me go ahead and turn this into a slide you can see really well. There we go. One of the things that you're going to notice in the book, in the reading, especially this, this week, is that uh, Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart do not really give you a framework uh, or a set process in how to determine meaning in these different uh, literary styles. One thing I'm going to try to give you along the way are some guidelines, some framework, maybe even um, a, a process of how to determine meaning in these different genres. For example, um, let me go ahead and give this to you. It'll be in my notes. And by the way, I'll start making my notes available starting tomorrow. You can come by the church um, during business hours or come by uh, during Sunday morning worship and get my notes on the reference table on the uh, at the front of the church, the reference center table, and it'll have more detail. But let me spend just a few minutes going over kind of a framework or a process of uh, determining meaning uh, tailor two epistles. So remember, and, and uh, I think the video did a good job, or Dr. Strauss did a good job of uh, helping you to understand that we first have to understand the historical context. We have to understand the situation because we're basically reading someone else's mail. Uh, the author was inspired to write this letter or write this epistle, and God chose to reveal himself through these epistles, but we have to realize that we are hearing only one side of the conversation. There's a whole situation around this, these epistles that we may or may not be able to discern just by reading the epistles. However, if we keep these things in mind, then we will be able to study and understand the meaning. The first step, <clears throat> and I can't I, I can't really emphasize this first step hard enough is to read aloud in one sitting that particular epistle without taking any notes. Sit down somewhere and actually read aloud that particular epistle. Most of the recipients, a uh, great majority of the recipients heard uh, these epistles rather than reading them. And when the author wrote them, it, they were written in order to be spoken. Some of the translators of, of the Bible into English have, have tried to keep that same style so that if you're reading it to someone or reading it to yourself, then it's, it's very understandable. But you, the first step has to be you got to dig in to the actual primary source, which is the Bible. And there's no substitute for really understanding meaning in the Bible than reading the Bible and reading large chunks of the Bible, how they were meant to be. They weren't meant to be pulled verse by verse or even paragraph by paragraph, but they were meant to be whole bodies of work uh, called epistles. So this first step, if you do this first step, you will probably be ahead of, I would say, probably a majority of Bible readers. Uh, this one step will help you understand more of the Bible than you can imagine. So I, I really want to emphasize taking the time to do that. We can sit still for a, a two-hour, uh, an hour and a half movie, 
we can <laughs> we can uh, have recreation. You know, we can go to a ball game and and sit down for two or three hours. I think we can sit down and spend some time in the Bible and actually read uh, to ourselves or even to someone else. That's a that's another idea. The second thing after reading aloud in one sitting without taking any notes is to read it again and you can read it aloud if you want or maybe not aloud but make some 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 very basic notes you don't have to go overboard here but you can make some very basic notes for example who's the author uh, a lot of times the the epistle writer will identify himself for example paul an apostle of christ jesus i mean it's right there in the first uh, in the first verse of, of a lot of the epistles. And that was the form. Instead of identifying yourself um, in, at the end, like we do in letters or maybe even emails today, they identified themselves first in, the, in, their, in their letters in the epistles. So who was the author? Who were the recipients? Uh, a lot of times Paul will say, Hey, to the Galatia or, or to the churches in Ephesus, or to the churches in the region of Galatia, uh, or to the Jews in such and such place, or 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 whatever. So you want to know the author, you want to know the recipient or recipients, and where they're located. If you read it a couple of times, sometimes you can even see where they are located, uh, whether they're in Rome or Galatia or, or whatever. So you've read it once aloud in one sitting. You read it again, just taking some very basic notes, and then you can start digging into what they call secondary sources. Primary source is the Bible. Secondary source is anything outside of the Bible. Uh, look up uh, if you're reading Corinthians, uh, read about Corinthians. What kind of city was it? How large was it? Um, was it important in the Roman Empire? What kind of people were in it? And so you can find this information in a good Bible dictionary or the introduction part of a commentary. So uh, most of the time, uh, I say it really almost all the time, a good Bible dictionary will give you information uh, and confirm really information that you've already already read. The third thing you want to do, I'm sorry, the, the fourth thing you really want to do is to read the entire epistle and note uh, some things a little more in depth. What are some of the characteristics of the author and the recipients? What are some of their attitudes? What's the occasion? Sometimes you can pick up why an epistle writer is writing. And you want to take a look at the whole epistle and see where are the natural logical divisions. A lot of times you can, you can tell where the introduction ends and the body begins. You can tell where the body ends and the epistle writer is, the epistle author is starting a conclusion. Um, a, a lot of the modern translations, English translations, will help you in that. Uh, but don't try to depend on that too much. But see if you can, you know, see where the big chunks are in that in that particular letter. So after you've done that, let me go back for a second. You've looked at the situation. After you looked at the situation, you should have some notes on the the author and the recipients, some of their attitudes, um, where they're located, and so you have a body of notes. Then you want to take a look at the argument. This is what we call the literary context. And Dr. Strauss did a good, uh, uh, I think, a good job in showing that you need to think in paragraphs. That's one of the advantages in our modern English translations. Uh, for example, the NIV, uh, the NLT, and, um, and some translations like that, is they've already chunked them up into paragraphs. Now, realize... Uh, those paragraphs are not revelation. Uh, nobody gave a revelation to whoever put them in paragraphs and said, this is a unit of thought. This is That is a scholar's opinion on one block of thought. And that's what we call a, a paragraph. Most of the time, you can probably rely on, on, on those paragraph divisions. However, I've seen some examples where a translator said this is a paragraph when in fact you could split it up a different way. 
and um, affects the meaning maybe just a little. So looking at the argument, what's important? You want to trace the argument paragraph by paragraph, thinking in paragraphs. The key thing also is that we have to understand what the author says and why he says it. The key thing is what is the point? Keep asking yourself as you're going through the epistle, as you're going through the letter, why, why is Paul saying this? Uh, why, why is he saying this now? What is he leading to? He's building up to something. You know, why is he saying it? If you keep asking yourself that question, then you will, you will uh, start to get it. Let me go back for just a minute and notice, I want to point this out. Notice how many times you're reading the epistle. You're reading it aloud once. You're reading it making uh, surface notes or, or preliminary notes, brief notes, and you're reading it again more in depth. That's three times. To me, that's Bible study. To me, that is getting in there and rightly dividing uh, the word. Rightly dividing the word is not necessarily uh, all the information you may find in a dictionary or, or a commentary, uh, and all those are great. But really getting in and reading large chunks of the Bible is what I would consider Bible study. Keep this in mind as you, let me get rid of this thing here. There we go. Keep this in mind this week as you go through your reading. And again, let me encourage you, even if you find it frustrating or maybe a little overwhelming because the book is dense, different than the story, even, even if you're struggling with it a little, keep this in mind. Let me encourage you to continue to go forward. We must understand the situation and the argument, those two things, of an epistle to determine the original intended meaning. And that's what we're going after. God re revealed himself through this author. So we're trying to get at their original intended meaning. And for specifically... Uh, uh, epistles, because they're occasional, we have to understand the situation and we have to understand the argument because each writer is making an argument, addressing something specific. So please keep this in mind as you go through, um, as you go through your reading. All right, bear with me a minute. I'm going to stop the sharing. There we go back to the real world. All right, so that's a lot of information. Uh, you'll have even more information when you read your book. If you have any questions or comments, I, I always like to emphasize this, please don't hesitate to text me or call me or email me or whatever to discuss anything uh, that you want to uh, discuss. And so that'll be important as you go through and maybe have, have some questions. Uh, just a couple of uh, reminders. I will leave this Zoom session open uh, after this session uh, so that if you want to uh, ask some questions or comments in a smaller group or want to fellowship or, or, or whatever, then you can feel free to hang out. This week, uh, you're going to read Chapter 3. Chapter 3, The Epistles, Learning to Think Contextually. Learning to Think Contextually. All right. Well, I'm going to open it up. I apologize. We're about five minutes over. Um, I've asked you to unmute. Are there any questions or comments um, before I say goodbye to the recording audience? Any questions or comments? No. All right. Camilla doesn't have any questions or comments, maybe we can go forward. <laughs> hey, Paul, are we going to be doing three or four next week? Um, we are going to be reading chapter three. However, uh, what's going to be presented is chapter four. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? No, I have one comment that I like when the presenter said there are just some things that does not have any meaning or we don't know anything about, so just leave it alone. <laughs> don't sweat. <laughs> don't be sweating on stuff that doesn't have an answer. 
Yeah, well, all of it does have all of it does have meaning uh, because mm -hmm. God has has chosen to reveal Himself in that particular text or passage or or whatever. Uh, and then there are some things that we don't understand until we grow into them as we get better at Bible study and uh, we grow in spiritual maturity. But yeah, he does provide that backstop. And there are some things that we may never uh, know for sure. But that shouldn't stop us from uh, doing study and it shouldn't stop us from uh, growing uh, in our right. maturity. Right, because he did point it out that that type of stuff is not doesn't change the doctrine of uh, what the writer is, what the Bible is trying to teach us. Right. Mm -hmm. the, main, the main thing, and I keep going back to this, uh, is get into the Word, get into the and, and read long sections of uh, chunks of the Bible, and you'd be surprised how how that helps your understanding. And, and you're communing uh, in the word with God. All right. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, you know, it's hard to um, interpret something if you don't know what it says. Mm -hmm. That's bas basically what the reading does. You know, you're not trying to interpret it while you're reading it. You're just trying to read it, know what it says. Exactly. Right. Most, they want to read and interpret at the same time. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And as uh, as Reverend Franklin knows, and he has he has taught us this as far as ministers and and stuff. But I've made this comment before. A lot of teachers and preachers, unfortunately, um, will go to a scripture and say, "Okay, what can I say about this?" You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, man, that sounds great. What can I say about this? But that's 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 on the road to reading into the scripture rather than, OK, what does it say? That's the first step is what does it say? Great comment, Reverend Franklin. Thank you. All right. Well, you all hang on for just a second. I'm going to say goodbye to our recording Students, thank you all so much for getting uh, sitting still and, and watching us go through this. If you ever want to join us live, call the church office. We can get you some information to get you on here live. And I hope to see you the next time. Thank you so much.